show your effort to come and give and to serve. So I understand that you uh, have some special guests to uh, bring up to the stage. Yeah, I, I guess uh, uh, first we wanted to just uh, Rennie, could you stand up? Rennie McCauley is our editor. Um, he's an amazing guy. Right here. He's as much a director as we are. As we know a doctor right here. Micah Dahl Anderson, could you stand up? Um, Micah did all of our music, original music. Um, and there's, I mean, there's lots of other people that help, but for the interest of time, we'll, we'll probably keep to this too. Um, we also, if there's someone in the audience who would like to have to stand up and recognize to um, Erna Stewart, um, the sister-in-law of Matthew Stewart is here. Erna, can you stand up please? We're really grateful to them and, and many other people that let us into our lives. And finally, we'd like to welcome up with, uh, a really special guest, uh, Dub Lawrence. to learn of Dub's story and how, how did this project come about? Yeah, um, so I was happened to be in Utah. I'm originally from Utah and I was playing in a softball game and Dub knew that I was a, a documentary film professor. I teach here in town at St. Edwards University. So he came and approached me at, at the end of the game, you know, in, 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 his, um, in his suit, you know, his, what he wore in the film, um, with the Dub name tag. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, I've got this really interesting project and story. Would you teach me how to edit? So I went over to his hangar and had showed me this, you know, he had edited this two hour long kind of police chief's analysis of the Brian Wood case. And I was blown away, you know, I, I thought, wow, there's a story here, right? A really compelling story. And, and then Brad and I were, we were doing a shoot in Oregon together. And, you know, the whole trip, we drove from Utah to Oregon. We talked about this film, you know, I said, hey, I met, met this guy, Dub. He's got this really compelling story, and, and you know, then Brad and I kind of decided from there to, to, to direct it together. Um, so that's really, I guess, the power of softball, right? All those home runs paid off. <laughs> um, amazing. Um, I, I would also like to, to know uh, how, did you have in mind what, you, what the ending of the documentary might be, or hope, that you hoped to be as you were shooting and editing, or, in, or how did that change, like how did you, decided to sort of leave the audience with what you left then. I'll answer and then Brad you jump in too. Um, so I, I feel like, you know, really we started with, with Dub's uh, story and all of the evidence that he collected, all the things that he had um, um, broken down in the Brian Wood case. So, we, you know, we, we, weren't, we weren't looking to make a film about the militarization of police at all. We were really blown away by Dub as a character and he was, you know, he was obsessive, he was interesting, he was passionate, you know, and I think we were drawn to Dub as the character, and then, you know, as we, we, we began shooting about three years ago and, and um, started, you know, after that, that shoot, you know, other cases started popping up in Utah, and, you know, I, I'll, I would read the Utah uh, Deseret News, Salt Lake Tribune, right? And, you know, all these cases were happening, and, and thought, okay, yeah, this, there, there's a lot more going on than we had, yeah. than we had suspected. Brad, would you... Yeah, we kind of thought, and I, and I was based in Utah, and we thought if it's happening this much in Utah, not necessarily a place you think of as a kind of hotbed of gang activity or places you, you, I don't know, active shooter, hostage kind of situations, but it seems like it's happening a lot. And um, and yeah, and of course it was. And this was, uh, you know, 2012, 2013, 
And then right after we pretty much were done shooting uh, at the end of last summer, Ferguson happened. Right. And uh, it, you know, it, the the national conversation we'd kind of been wondering why it hadn't quite started yet started to happen, and we got. You know, as Scott said, we were attracted to, to Dub's really unique story, and we definitely got um, swept into it. And it, it felt like the right time to uh, to try to uh, get it out. A lot, as you saw in the end credits, a lot of these cases are going to be kind of ongoing. that could take years more, and at yeah. some point, we kind of felt like we needed to show how far everyone had come and, and go from there. Yeah. Great. Uh, questions from yeah. Okay. Um, I want to first thank you for showing that white people also suffer the same things that the national media has done about black youth. And I'm not taking a racial position, but that it seems to have all been framed around poor or middle class black youth. And here we have uh, non-black people that suffer the same kind of behavior from the police department. But my question to Dub is, uh, thank you, first of all, for being who you are and always having a smile at the same time. I mean, that's remarkable. What do we do when police lie, media believes them, and juries dismiss? So the question was, um, uh, what do we do when police lie, and the press believes them, and juries dismiss cases? First of all, can I make a comment? <laughs> I'm a little bit emotional here because this is the first time I've seen this film in its entirety also. <laughs> there are things that I haven't seen before. And uh, I need to say this. These two guys can charm Satan and they confess in his own sins. <laughs> they were able to get footage from people that I couldn't talk to with all of my years of connections. Uh, they were able to get footage and we fudged and we used footage that you don't see normally in any kind of a documentary film or any kind of a film. This is real footage, um, real evidence. And these guys were absolutely incredible. Now that I've said that, um, in response to your question, it's the laws, it's the lawmakers. Your governmental immunity gives law enforcement profession, government employees, protections. Police officers can lie with impunity. You as a citizen can't. You get prosecuted if you render false information to a police officer. It's the laws that we have put into place over the last 30, 35 years, specifically since 1982, I've been tracking those, and I have I've actually argued one case before the Utah State Supreme Court. <laughs> All five justices and panel is pro se. I'm not an attorney, uh, but I have 50 years, a half a century of experience with the law. And even in the Marine Corps, uh, I worked with the Battalion Legal Office, so I was involved in war crimes during the Vietnam era. So. It goes back a long time, and I've watched it as it's deteriorated um, over the few, last three or four decades. Um, when a jury cannot get the truth, when the truth is blocked with motions to suppress, motions to quash, motions for summary judgment, governmental immunity is used as a defense. If you trigger the rules of law, I've actually been criticized for agreeing with judges who rendered judgments that seem to be totally unfair because judges are bound by the law. And if a judge renders a verdict that is within the scope of the law, he ruled correctly. So my, my look at, my take on this is the big picture. My take is Congress has, a, has passed bad laws. State legislators have passed bad laws. We as people, citizens of the United States, have the right to petition through referendum to correct a bad law, signatures 
to correct bad laws that are implemented by our state legislators, or we can initiate a petition, and in, in that manner, we as citizens have a say. But even the right to petition our government for redress has been restricted so much that it's very difficult to get enough signatures within the time frame that you're allotted and the number of signatures required, so it makes it almost impossible for us as citizens, you as lay people, to change or challenge a law. So, I actually, can I do this? I, I apologize, but I ran in 2012, I filed to run against Congre uh, Senator Orrin Hatch no, for the United States Senate. <laughs> Orrin Hatch had to spend $12.1 million <laughs> The first time he's ever been forced into a primary runoff, <laughs> and uh, I spent less than five thousand. But <laughs> there was, I didn't even have to file an FEC report. But I did. <laughs> I did accomplish one thing. In 1982, Utah rescinded one of the best laws that we ever had in our state constitution, and it read: It's Article Six, Section 23. It reads. Any bill passed by the House or Senate must contain only one subject and be clearly identified by its title. All it says today is rescinded 1982. After the campaign, that was my focus, that was my issue, that's what I pushed. There are lots of reasons for that, and if you'll analyze it, you'll understand how important that is. Any bill passed by the House or Senate must contain only one subject to be clearly identified by its title. Uh, Representative Craig Powell sponsored a bill in the beginning session of the uh, 2013 legislature, and it was reinstated after 31 years of being out of our state constitution. So I feel like the 5,000 bucks is well spent. <laughs> It might be another good thing to mention that along with you know the obvious ways you might imagine of, of, of continuing the conversation and seeing other places, uh, you can see the film. Our website, peaceofficerfilm.com, at some point will for sure continue to include places where you can get involved, other kind of action items. Yeah. Other questions? Right oh, there. Real quick, too. I don't remember if we mentioned. This is Dave Lawrence. Dave was the producer and opened up tons of things that we couldn't do. And I just want to make sure we that's kind of
bring it to that. Actually, I heard uh, return uh, soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan that said that there's uh, more consideration and more respect for the enemies in those environments than we have here at home. Um, what can we do? Um, there, there needs to be four things that, that I, I see. Number one is accountability. You know, we don't have a lot of accountability because of the rules and guidelines and provincial calls. We need, we need to have transparency. You know, we need to know, we need to be able to see the records. We need to be able to get them without having to go through what we had to go through and wait two and a half years to get things we should have been able to get shortly after the investigation started. We need to deal with, uh, finally, uh, the uh, police who have protected governmental immunity. That's just wrong. It, it's just wrong. Um, I don't know exactly what I would recommend other than starting with the point that, that, I, that I've made for, tried to make for 24 years. Um, that accountability could be restored um, with that proposal. With, if Congress, either by rules or guidelines, or uh, somehow could, could implement that approach, that's a good starting place. If accountability, uh, uh, I, I'm just, it's so huge and there's so many things that have happened over the last 30, 35 years that you cannot correct it with one or two things. It's going to take a while to build back what is broken. Uh, yes, right there. Uh, the question was, why uh, do, does the police um, give any uh, reason why they do these search warrant uh, things at night? When I was county sheriff, uh, my deputies served over 16,000 warrants of every type and description, and we never had a single person reported hurt or injured or nobody got killed. My SWAT team during the years that I served as county sheriff never killed anybody. And the way you do that is reasonable and prudent judgment. You serve warrants in daylight hours when people are coming home from work, when they're in their yard or when they start leaving in the morning. You don't need to serve warrants in the middle of the night. Breaking in people's homes, it violates the castle doctrine, it violates the premise of search warrants in the first place. Uh, reasonable warrants should reasonable judgment should prevail and should have been prevailing all along and the film we tried to show uh, they, they showed there uh, beginning with President Nixon and the war on drugs uh, continuing with President uh, uh, Reagan uh, expanding that concept that idea until today we're desensitized we, we, we just expect something that police do we gotta they're, they're only, here's something we need to understand only two ways that you can actually suspend the Constitution of the United States. Number one is in time of war. And number two is when there is a threat to national security. And we can actually forget we got a supreme law of our land and it's an exemption. And so if you declare war on drugs, war on crime, war on pornography, war on terror, I mean, if you declare war, then you can get a legal <coughs> ruling from an attorney general, or, uh, and the president can even get a ruling that water boarding is okay, because we are a threat to national security or we are in time of war. And so we need to back up 
and undeclare some of the wars and just enforce the law fairly and equitably across the board so everybody is like the reason for our country being so different and so great is because we have the right we're endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and just give us our dignity and give us our respect and we'll do the rest. We don't need government to tell us to do everything. Um, well, unfortunately, we have to uh, uh, we have to go. Um, so the next film can can roll in here. But thank you again so much for making the film.